Ja, herzlich willkommen auch von meiner Seite. Mein Name ist Patrick Siegeler. Ich bin Direktor des Anne-Frank-Zentrums in Berlin. Und ich äh, heiße Sie alle recht herzlich willkommen zum heutigen Zeitzeugengespräch mit Peter Konstam und zur Lesung aus seinem Buch Mut zum Leben. Ich möchte Sie ganz herzlich nicht nur im Namen des Anne-Frank-Zentrums zur heutigen Veranstaltung begrüßen, sondern auch im Namen der Kooperationspartner, dem ADL, der Anti-Defamation League, der Initiative für Menschenwürde Artikel 1 und der Amadeo Antonio Stiftung, in deren Rahmen, nämlich in den Bildungs- und Aktionswochen gegen Antisemitismus, diese heutige Veranstaltung stattfindet. Ja, David Dillis hatte schon gesagt, wir freuen uns über das große Interesse, dass sich bereits fast 100 Teilnehmende angemeldet und heute zugeschaltet haben. Das ist durchaus eben auch der Vorteil eines digitalen Formates und wir freuen uns darüber, dass Sie das so gut und gerne heute hier annehmen. Am Anfang möchte ich natürlich einen Gast besonders begrüßen und das ist Peter Konstam und seine Frau. Und wenn jetzt technisch alles klappt, dann müsste er uns jetzt kurz eingeblendet werden. Wir warten ganz kurz. Ja, das sieht doch schon sehr gut. Hello Peter, hello Susan. A warm greeting from Berlin to Florida. Uh, it's a big pleasure for us to have you here with us uh, tonight. And we will soon hear and see you later. See you soon. I, I look forward to Daneben möchte ich ganz herzlich begrüßen Alexander Wertmann, den Sie später auch sehen und hören werden und der heute Peter bzw. seinem Vater Hans Konstam seine Stimme leihen wird. Daneben freuen wir uns sehr, dass wir stellvertretend für unsere Freundeskreismitglieder, die heute dabei sind, Franz und Petra Michalski begrüßen dürfen. Franz Michalski ist auch immer wieder mit seiner Frau ein Gast von uns und erzählt von seiner äh, Geschichte des Untertauchens. Dann freue ich mich über den, äh, die Teilnahme der äh, Kolleginnen und Kollegen und des Eurer Exzellenz, dem Botschafter des Königreichs der Niederlande, Wilke Kingmar, der heute auch mit dabei ist. Für unsere Kooperationspartner begrüße ich besonders Dalia Greenfeld für die Anti-Defamation League, Herrn Kajo Wasserhöfel für die äh, Initiative äh, Menschenwürde Artikel 1 und Nikolaus Lelle von der Amadeo Antonio Stiftung. Besonders begrüßen möchte ich auch Herrn Helmut Schwarz, der uns aus Nürnberg zugeschalten ist. Helmut Schwarz ist nämlich derjenige, der für dieses schöne Buch verantwortlich ist und es herausgegeben hat, die Memoiren von Peter und seinem Vater Hans Konstam. Herzlich willkommen, Herr Schwarz. Wolfram Pemp ist uns auch zugeschaltet, der Antisemitismusbeauftragte der Berliner Polizei. Und dann möchte ich auch ganz herzlich meine Kolleginnen und Kollegen und vor allem heute auch unsere freien Mitarbeiterinnen und Mitarbeiter begrüßen, das vielleicht auch deswegen, weil in diesen Zeiten der Corona-Pandemie zu oft vergessen wird, wie viele Studierende, freie Mitarbeiter es in Museen und Gedenkstätten gibt, die derzeit keine Einkunfts und, ja, Einkommensmöglichkeit haben. Und von daher freue ich mich umso mehr, dass ihr trotzdem uns die Treue hält und heute Abend auch mit dabei seid bei dieser Veranstaltung. Letzte Woche gedachten wir hier in Deutschland und weltweit am 27. Januar der Befreiung des Konzentrations- und Vernichtungslager Auschwitz. Jener Tag, an dem auch Otto Frank, eines Vater von der Roten Armee in Auschwitz befreit wurde. Seit 2005 ist der 27. Januar der internationale Holocaust-Gedenktag und zu diesem Anlass findet auch die heutige Veranstaltung mit Peter Konstam statt. Wir haben Peter im Jahr 19, 2019, also vor etwa zwei Jahren, kennengelernt im Rahmen unseres jährlich stattfindenden Anne-Frank-Tags. Wir hatten ihn eingeladen zum 90. Geburtstag von Anne-Frank am 12. Juni, um über 
die Geschichte von Anne Frank, aber vor allem auch über seine eigene Geschichte zu erzählen. Ich freue mich sehr, dass dies aus dieser ersten Begegnung eine Freundschaft äh, geworden ist und wir regelmäßig mit Peter äh, und seiner Frau Susan in Kontakt sind. Peter Konstam gehört zu den wenigen Menschen, noch lebenden Menschen, die äh, Anne Frank persönlich kennengelernt haben. Das ist schon etwas sehr Besonderes an sich, aber ganz wichtig ist es, dass es heute eben nicht nur um diese Bekanntschaft und diese Freundschaft mit Anne Frank geht, sondern dass wir heute eben auch seine Geschichte, seine Fluchtgeschichte und die seiner Familie kennenlernen werden. Ich freue mich sehr, dass ich nun überleiten darf zu Dahlia Greenfeld, der Assistant Director for European Affairs bei der Anti-Defamation League und sie hat sich bereit erklärt, heute ein Grußwort zu Ihnen zu sprechen. Hallo Dalia und wir werden dich jetzt einblenden. Hallo, guten Abend. Guten Abend, ich darf Sie auch meinerseits begrüßen zu einem wertvollen Zeitzeugengespräch, zu einer Zeit, die kaum wichtiger sein könnte. Unsere Zeit. Letzten Mittwoch erst haben wir den 27. Januar, also den internationalen Holocaust-Gedenktag, gefeiert oder erinnert, was ist das richtige Wort. Wir haben wie jedes Jahr, das sage ich als junge jüdische Person in Deutschland, Kranzniederlegungen gesehen, wir haben betrübte Gesichter gesehen, wir haben auf Social Media Hashtag We Remember Heaven, Hashtag Never Again und viele andere gesehen. Doch ich frage mich besonders heute, besonders dieses Jahr, was bedeutet das wirklich? Wie viele haben mal mit einer echten jüdischen Person gesprochen? Wie viele kennen die Lebensrealitäten, die sagen, sie erinnern und sie gedenken? Wie viele haben eigene Lehren aus der Shoah, aus dem Holocaust, Poraimus gelehrt? Und wie wirklich sieht die Erinnerung authentisch aus? Wie kann sie nicht nur aussehen, als wäre sie authentisch, sondern wie kann Erinnerung an den Holocaust, an die Shoah, an das alles, was passiert ist, auch authentisch sein? Ich darf heute im Namen der Enter Defamation League, einer über 100 Jahre alten jüdischen und Bürgerinnenrechtsorganisation sprechen, die Antisemitismus und alle Formen von Hass bekämpft. Jedes Jahr geben wir eine Studie raus, die Global 100 heißt. Und bei dieser Studie, beispielsweise 2019, kam raus, 92 Prozent der Deutschen sagen Ja zu der Frage, ob Juden noch zu viel darüber reden, was mit ihnen im Holocaust passiert ist. Das heißt, quasi jede zweite Person in Deutschland, wahrscheinlich nicht jede zweite Person in diesem Zoom-Webinar, aber fast jede zweite deutsche Person sagt, dass wir als Juden und Jüdinnen zu viel darüber reden, was uns im Holocaust widerfahren ist. Das ist eine inakzeptable Zahl. Es ist auch eine dramatische Realität und es bedarf an Handlungen deswegen. Wir leben in einer Zeit, in der wir Erinnerungsarbeit redefinieren müssen. Wir haben ein jüdisches Sprichwort, das sagt, bis 120 solle man leben. Und ich wünsche allen Anwesenden hier bis 120 und weiter zu leben. Aber die Realität, selbst wenn das erreicht ist, bedeutet, dass uns Zeitzeugen wie Peter beispielsweise irgendwann nicht mehr live und real erzählen können. Das heißt, wir leben in einer Zeit, in der wir Erinnerungsarbeit etwas neu denken müssen. Und da fällt oft das Wort Digitalisierung. Es ist ein Stichwort, es ist ein wichtiges Wort. Aber wie eins gesagt worden ist, nur weil es digital ist, ist es nicht gleich besser. Nur weil es digital ist, erreicht es nicht unbedingt alle Leute, die es vorher nicht erreicht hat. Es gibt eine weitere Studie, die besagt, 25 Prozent, also jeder und jede vierte Person in Deutschland zwischen 14 und 26 Jahren, weiß nicht, was Auschwitz ist. Und das bedeutet nicht, sie können nicht nagelnau sagen, wo auf der Karte Auschwitz ist. Sie können mit dem Begriff Auschwitz nicht, nichts anfangen. Das heißt, mit unserer Redefinierung von Erinnerungsarbeit, müssen wir darüber nachdenken, wie erreichen wir neue Gruppen, welche Emotionen können wir bilden, welche Bildung können wir darlegen, um neue Gruppen, beispielsweise Einwanderungsgesellschaften, mit an diese Geschichten zu binden und wirklich Lebensrealitäten zu verstehen und Lehren daraus zu ziehen. Wir brauchen neue Anknüpfpunkte. Wir leben auch in einer Zeit, in der Rechtspopulismus, Rechtsradikalismus, Extremismus, Antisemitismus und viele weitere Formen von Hass steigen. In Deutschland wir haben hier viele Städte vertreten, in Europa oder auch der Welt. Und diese ExtremistInnen, selbst die vernetzen sich international, wie wir in zahlreichen Studien auch von uns beispielsweise dargelegt haben. Corona und Antisemitismus sind zwei Wörter, die leider Hand in Hand zusammengehen. Und das betrifft nicht nur uns Juden und Jüdinnen, sondern das betrifft wiederum alle in Deutschland und darüber hinaus. Deswegen, besonders hier und heute in diesem Zeitzeugengespräch mit Peter Konstam, finde ich es sehr wichtig, darauf hinzuweisen, dass wir verschiedene Generationen hier vor Ort haben. 
Diese verschiedenen Generationen haben Wahrnehmungen aus der Welt, die aus der Vergangenheit schöpfen, die aber auch in die Zukunft blicken und in der Gegenwart existieren. Ich freue mich sehr, dass ich mit einem Vorgespräch mit Peter darüber sprechen konnte, wie meine und seine Familiengeschichte gleiche Lebenspunkte hatten in Argentinien, aber auch anderen Orten der Welt und andere typisch jüdische Elemente hatten. Gleichzeitig, Sie werden auch hören von Alexander Wertmann, einem begabten Schauspieler und einem Menschen, den ich aus jüdischen Ferienlagern noch kenne, als jüdische Jugendleiterin. Das heißt, wir haben verschiedene Generationen, die aber zu diesem wichtigen Thema der Erinnerungsarbeit, des Gedenkens, der Kultur, des, des Holocaust und des daraus Lernens zusammenkommen. Diese typisch jüdischen Elemente sind das Gemeinsame, das Verbindende und das gemeinsam Lernende, das gemeinsam Debattierende, Unterhaltende, Sprechende. Und diese jüdischen Elemente darf man nicht vergessen, denn im Jahr 2021 feiern wir 1700 Jahre jüdisches Leben. Wir feiern 1700 Jahre von definitiv existierendem jüdischen Leben in Deutschland. Wir feiern damit die guten und die schlechten Tage, wie bei einem Geburtstag. Das heißt, wir feiern mit das, was wir erlebt haben, was wir geschafft haben als Juden und Jüdinnen, was wir als Gesamtgesellschaft gefeiert haben auch in dieser Zeit. Deswegen in dem Jahr 2021 besonders darf man nicht vergessen, welche jüdischen Elemente im Positiven auch existieren in Deutschland, in der Vergangenheit, in der Zukunft und in der Gegenwart. Wir haben heute noch 333 Tage bis zum Ende dieses Jahres und ich hoffe, dass wir uns in diesem Jahr besonders damit beschäftigen können, welche Lehren wir aus der Shoah, aus dem Holocaust ziehen können und welchen Beitrag ich als Individuum leisten kann, welchen Beitrag Sie als Individuum leisten können und welchen Beitrag wir auch als Gemeinschaft an diesem jüdischen verbindenden Element wie als Gesamtgesellschaft leisten können. Wir haben verschiedene Wege, Musik, Tanz, Fotografie und Film oder Spielabende und Touren durch eine Stadt und über jüdisches Leben lernen. Ich habe die Eingangsfrage gestellt, Erinnerungs, wie kann das authentisch sein? Erinnerungsarbeit, die wirklich ankommt. Das ist eine Frage, die ich mir sehr häufig stelle. Und ich glaube, die Antwort ist, oder eine der Antwortmöglichkeiten ist, echte Verbindungen zuzulassen, sie gegebenenfalls auch zu suchen, sie zu fördern und zu schauen, was passiert. Und dabei neue Wege einzusteigen, einzusteigen, digital und darüber hinaus. Daher mit diesem Abend würde ich behaupten, wir haben eine Möglichkeit, eine nachhaltige, eine wertvolle und eine authentische Art der Erinnerungsarbeit zu leisten. Dabei haben wir mit diesem Abend aber auch eine Möglichkeit, Zukunftsarbeit zu leisten und die Verbindung von diesen Themen, von diesen verschiedenen Generationen, die zusammenkommen, von den Geschichten, von den Worten, von den Lehren, die auch aus verschiedenen Generationen zusammenkommen, bin ich sehr gespannt zu, zu hören, zu lernen, vielleicht zu diskutieren, debattieren und danach in einer Reflexion damit rauszugehen. Denn es ist nicht nur heute der 2. Februar, es sind die weiteren 333 Tage im Jahr 2021, es sind die hunderten Tage bis zum jüdischen Neujahr Rosh Hashanah und diese Tage in diesem Jahr, in diesem Monat müssen wir nutzen, weil darüber hinaus kommen viele weitere Monate und Jahre und Tage. Und in dieser Zeit wünsche ich uns allen, dass wir echte Verbindungen knüpfen können, dass wir Erinnerungsarbeit so leisten können, dass wir in einer Gesellschaft leben, in der wir gemeinsam gegen Hass, gegen Antisemitismus und die verschiedensten Formen vorgehen können und wir das Gefühl haben, und authentische Erinnerungsarbeit zu leisten. Und bin sehr gespannt, von Menschen wie Peter zu hören. In diesem Sinne, vielen Dank für die Kooperation, vielen Dank für die Einladung und äh, Peter, I, my deepest gratitude to you, Peter, that you are still doing this amazing work about um, Holocaust education. I look forward to hearing from you and the other panelists and the other participants here. Also vielen Dank und äh, ich wünsche uns eine reflektive Arbeit heute Abend. Danke. Ja, vielen herzlichen Dank, Dalia Greenfeld, für dieses Grußwort, das uns daran erinnert, dass Erinnerung eben immer etwas auch mit der Gegenwart zu tun hat. Und äh, von den vielen Gesprächen, die ich mit Peter in der Vergangenheit schon hatte, weiß ich, wie sehr auch ihm es ein Anliegen ist, die äh, Arbeit äh, zur Geschichte von Anne Frank und seiner eigenen Geschichte auch immer zu verbinden mit Fragen an die Gegenwart und was das mit der Auseinandersetzung mit Antisemitismus, Rassismus und jeglicher Form von Menschenfeindlichkeit in der Gegenwart zu tun hat, sowohl in Europa als auch in den USA. Ja, Alexander Wertmann wurde jetzt schon öfters erwähnt. Alexander ist schönerweise bei uns hier im Studio der Räume von Artikel 1. Und ich würde Alexander jetzt kurz ihn vorstellen und ihn zu mir an den Tisch bitten. Ja. Hallo. 
Herzlich willkommen, Alexander. Für Sie, die sollten Sie Alexander Wertmann noch nicht kennen, der heute eben aus dem Buch von Peter liest, ein paar Worte zu ihm. Alexander wurde 1997 in Schwerin geboren, ist dann später nach München gezogen und hat schon als Kind und Jugendlicher viele Erfahrungen im Theaterbereich gesammelt. Unter anderem eben auch beim Gärtnerplatztheater in der Gärtnerplatzjugend oder bei der Jungen Resi, das ist das äh, junge Schauspielhaus vom Münchner Residenztheater. Seine Leidenschaft, die er eben schon als Kind und Jugendlicher hatte, hat er jetzt so quasi langsam zu seinem Beruf gemacht. Seit 2017 äh, besuchte er die Hochschule für Schauspielkunst Ernst Busch äh, hier in Berlin. Und äh, wenn Sie das, Ihnen das Gesicht vielleicht doch bekannt äh, vorkommt, Sie kennen ihn äh, vielleicht aus dem viel beachteten Film Masseltoff Cocktail äh, von Arkadi Kait, äh, der viele Preise bekommen hat, den wir vor etwa zwei Monaten auch im Rahmen der Aktions- und Bildungswochen gegen Antisemitismus gezeigt haben. Und in diesem Film Masseltoff Cocktail, den es übrigens immer noch auf der Arte Mediathek zu sehen gibt, also alle anschauen, die das noch nicht gemacht haben. In diesem Film spielte die Hauptfigur Dimitri Liebermann. Schön, dass du heute bei uns ja. bist und wir werden dich ja dann später noch live erleben und hören. Ja, bis später. Ja, wie wir in der Einladung schon angekündigt haben, wird diese heutige Veranstaltung auf Deutsch und auf Englisch im Wechsel stattfinden. Und äh, ich werde jetzt, da wir nun Peter dazu schalten werden, äh, schon mal ins äh, Englische wechseln. So, we just wait and see if we can see Peter. Here you are. Hello, Peter. Hello to Florida. <laughs> okay, can I say something before we start, please? Oh, of course. You are the star of the, the, today's evening. <laughs> I want to uh, take this opportunity to thank you for friendship and for the crazy idea, I don't know what you smoked, <laughs> you have invited me to give this presentation out of the thousands that you could have chosen <laughs> to do this. I'm in awe and I'm humbled that in a way, this presentation is bringing my roots to Germany where my parents and ancestry came from. I'm delighted and well, first of all, I want to thank David Gillis Dahlia, who gave a wonderful speech, um, Alexander, who is going to be reading the Mazel Tov. So Mazel Tov, Alexander. Um, and everybody else who has participated in organizing, planning, and toiling to prepare this test that we are about to, to uh, present. In addition, I want to acknowledge and thank Helmut, who is someplace here, and, some, and somebody from uh, uh, Fürth, who I don't know who that is, and welcome all, and I'm in, now in your hands. Thank you, Peter, and you're very welcome. It's an honor for us to have you uh, here uh, tonight. We will go into your story a little bit uh, before uh, Alexander will read from your book. And we wanted, of course, to start at the beginning. You were born on the 18th of June, 1936, and that was in Amsterdam. So that was uh, about uh, seven years after Anne Frank was uh, born. But originally your parents came from Fürth uh, by Nuremberg, Uh, where they had a business, or your father's family had a business of toys production. Only later they decided to emigrate, to flee from Nazi Germany uh, to Amsterdam, where you became neighbors of the family Frank. Before we have a look into the story, how it was, what it, what, what it, what it was like in Amsterdam, 
let's start a little bit to talk about your ancestors, your family in Nuremberg and Fürth. And maybe you can tell us a little bit more about your parents and your great, uh, your grandparents' business in Fürth. Um, the Konstam family started in 1650 in, in Germany, um, north of Nuremberg, in, uh, around Frankfurt. Somehow my family Konstam with one M spelled, the others are two M's at the end, stayed and my great grandfather who came from, um, I think Memmelsdorf, um, uh, which is outside of Bamberg. And if I understood it correctly, uh, uh, a few years ago, uh, Helmut took us around uh, that area. He was in the hops business and eventually they moved to Bamberg where my mater paternal grandmother came from. And then from there, they went to Nuremberg. I guess Nuremberg was the big city, etc. The Konstam family uh, or ancestry uh, dates back to 1870 something. Uh, some of the buildings they built are still standing in Nuremberg. And they were in the toy merchandising business. Uh, and they became in as much uh, important and well known in, in various cities in Germany, eventually England, Czechoslovakia, and the Netherlands. And what they did, they designed pin mechanical toys. And that was something new because until those days in 1890, 1910, toys were out of wood and dolls and naturally led, led uh, the little toy uh, soldiers that we all played with and whatever out of lead. So these tin mechanical toys was an, a nouvelle idea. The, the toys uh, moved and did noises, et cetera, et cetera. So that sort of is the story of the Konstams. And your father, Hans, um, did he also go into the toy business or what was he looking for? <laughs> well, he, there was an arrangement in the family but between him and his father. And the understanding that arrangement was, my father wanted to become an artist, always a painter. He also had talents in writing, by the way. Um, Which we see in the book. Hmm. Well, yes, but no, he, he wrote po po poetry and all kinds of things, but I don't have any books left that he, but in any event, uh, you know, that was Germany then, and you had to have a business and you had to work and you had to, etc. So the arrangement was, okay, you can go to art school, but I want you to work for us as well. So he sort of became a salesman and traveled. Uh, he, he, he sort of was a marketing salesperson, but uh, he also went to Bauhaus and, and had, met some uh, students who were already somewhat known, some becoming known. Uh, he mentioned names like, um, Clay and, and Picasso and, and a Swiss painter, I forget his name, Beck, Beckman, and etc. So he, he, he wanted to paint. And, and, and so that is what he did. So mm -hmm. the sales was uh, <laughs> an excuse to paint, let's put it that way. Okay. We have two or three pictures prepared uh, that uh, uh, David will now show to everyone. And the first picture we see is uh, the picture of your parents' wedding. 
Maybe you can tell us more about that. How did your parents get to know each other and when did they marry? Okay. Um, my maternal grandmother, um, who must have been quite a, a lady when she was young, uh, thought that it would be a very good match for her daughter to meet somebody who was in the middle upper class in, in the city of Nuremberg. We, uh, my, the, the, her side of the family came from Hof, which is not that far from Nuremberg. So a match was made and eventually she married my father. And there, there, there is the photograph. And that was in 1932. And where was it exactly, Peter? What? Where? Where was it exactly? Uh, this was a number. Exactly, and it is. Uh, was the, the it was in the main. That was the Haupt synagogue, and I don't know who all those other relatives are, unfortunately. Um, and this synagogue, by the way, while we are at it, was completely destroyed. One of the many that was destroyed during Kristallnacht. We have two more pictures. Uh, one is, you just mentioned the metal uh, tin, or the tin, uh, technical tin toys. One of, uh, one of these examples we can see here, maybe the older generations watching us uh, today even might know Moko. Uh, where does Moko come from? Well, Moko is the uh, the composition of Moses Kornstam, and that became the trade name. Mm. Now, th th this, this particular toy, and actually Helmut, uh, Dr. Helmut uh, 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 Schwarz is watching, so he can tell you better, but <laughs> this is a, a more modern toy. I don't know that that is in metal, it may be in plastic, and it's already in English. So mm -hmm. it, it, it's post, it's, it's after, my grandfather had two brothers and they were all Moko or working for Moko rather. And then they went to England, two brothers. My grandfather stayed behind. And so Moko became, uh, 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 progressed in, in England in the forties and in the middle, uh, until the uh, middle, late fifties. Thanks. And next to it, we can see a picture of your father in front of one of his artworks. Was that taken around the same time? Do you remember? No. Uh, that's an interesting photograph. And um, I would think that that is one of the few photographs that survived the war of he painting uh, Adam and Eve. So that's all what I can tell you. I, I, okay. I, I don't have more story than that. Yeah. Because the artwork that he painted until his flight or escape from um, uh, Nuremberg uh, was all taken over and, and disappeared. Included. We have a very big, from my understand, a very wonderful paint collection. Uh, not a museum, but almost, and many, many fine books and, and graphic uh, artwork. And that unfortunately was all disappeared. This is one of the few paint and paintings that survived. Okay. Peter, one year after they got married, your parents um, and the Nazi came to power, uh, they decided to leave to Amsterdam. Um, why Amsterdam? Did they have any relations to Amsterdam before? Okay. Um, as you all well know, since most of the people that have logged into this presentation are from Germany, Germany and the lowlands and other countries in Europe are known to be proud or were proud to show their living rooms with the curtains half open, the lace curtains. 
And at that time, my father lived in a ground floor apartment and he had a painting of a Saint Sebastian. And I would love to get hold of that painting one day, but I don't know what happened to it. It was seen by somebody walking the street who looked into the apartment and went to the police chief of Nuremberg and accused uh, my father and the painting of degenerate. Now, as we all know, of those who have read history, is that all the art, work, paintings, compositions, uh, theater, um, uh, music, were especially Jewish people were accused of degenerate. So, um, my he, the chief of police called my grandfather, who called my father, and this was in the early afternoon, and told him what the story was. And the chief of police said, he better leave because they're going to come after him. And that's the end of that story. And don't forget, this is 1933. So we were, the war hadn't happened yet. Probably the movement in Germany uh, and other countries neighboring started on persecution, anti-Semitism and anti-racism. The truth is, my, my grandfather then, uh, and my parents were a year, about. So you can still say they were sort of on a honeymoon period. And told him he had to leave. And he better leave quickly. So there was a very emotional discussion uh, on both sides. Uh, my father's father prevailed. And so my father took a train and went to Amsterdam. Now my mother was to follow three days later. Why? Because he felt my father had to get a place to live, where to stay, etc. Why Amsterdam? The Netherlands was known in those days as being neutral. In addition, Konstams had an office and a warehouse in Amsterdam. And um, my father's father felt that he could make, uh, earn some money, have some uh, income, just married and see what, how they could uh, build a life. Naturally, the other thought was that it was hoped that this was a, a, a way station that maybe the war that some people thought already that could happen, wouldn't happen. Mm -hmm. And so that is how the story evolved. Okay. So your parents went to Amsterdam, but not only them, uh, also your grandmother moved to uh, Amsterdam. How come? Well, my mother, Uh, got her mother um, to come, especially when I was born, uh, three years later in 1936. And before the occupation, in, 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 in spite that things were already getting gradually uh, worse for the Jewish people and, and some not Jewish people, from the period of 33 to 1936. My mother was still working and she was a pioneer kindergarten teacher in the Montessori philosophy. Montessori died, lived and a few times and, and died in the Netherlands. So um, she needed somebody to babysit me and take care of the apartment. And so that is how my grandmother eventually, who, who was a widow, and then there is a strange situation. She had married, uh, my maternal grandfather was killed as a German soldier during the First World War. And so she came and took care of the house and 
uh, was an excellent baker. She was uh, really nice. Um, also to Anna Frank, by the way. And that is how that happened. Okay. We will hear more about uh, the Merwede plane where your family was living in the neighborhood of the family Frank and many other uh, German Jewish people in exile. But before we do so, we will hear the first part uh, from your book. Um, and uh, it will be about the also good times you uh, had uh, in Amsterdam. We hear a short impression. And just for the listeners and the audience uh, to make sure that this, the book is based on the memoirs, the written memoirs of Peter's uh, father, Hans. And therefore, uh, what you hear now is always from Peter's father's uh, perspective. So, Alexander, the floor is yours now. So. <laughs> Sonntags ging ich gerne zum Angeln an einen Teich oder Fluss am Stadtrand von Amsterdam. Die gefangenen Krapfen, Hechte oder Barsche setzte ich zu Hause in die gefüllte Badewanne und ließ sie dort bis zur Zubereitung schwimmen. Beim ersten Mal war Peter vollkommen fasziniert, als er die Fische durchs Wasser flitzen sah. Er war gar nicht mehr von der Badewanne wegzukriegen, nicht einmal die Aussicht auf eine gute Nachspeise konnte ihn fortflocken. Als er älter wurde, nahm ich ihn manchmal zum Angeln mit. Peter saß dann hinter mir auf dem Fahrrad und hatte seine Arme um meine Hüften geschlungen, wir schmetterten populäre Schlager, während wir die Deiche und Kanäle entlang fuhren. Ein großer Teil des Lebens in unserem Viertel spielte sich im Freien ab. Die Merwerder Plainstraat bestand eigentlich aus zwei Straßen, die an den Längsseiten einen kleinen Park in Form eines spitzwinkligen Dreiecks begrenzten. Entlang der beiden Straßen standen Mietshäuser aus dunkelrotem Klinker. An dem Punkt, an dem die Straßen aufeinander trafen, ragte ein zwölfstöckiges Wohnhaus auf, das wir Wolkenkrabber, Wolkenkratzer nannten. Es war damals eines der höchsten Gebäude von Amsterdam. Auf der gegenüberliegenden Seite verband eine Art Boulevard die beiden Straßen. Der Park hatte Bäume und Bänke und einen großen runden Sandkasten, der von Betonmäuerchen begrenzt war. Die Gebäude in unserer Straße trugen ungerade Nummern, wir wohnten in Nummer 17, während sich auf der anderen Parkseite die Häuser mit gerader Nummer befanden. Die Kinder konnten ungefährdet auf dem Gehsteig und auf der Straße spielen, motorisierten Verkehr gab es kaum. Großmutter Clara war immer dabei, wenn Peter auf die Bäume kletterte oder im Sandkasten spielte. Sie passte auch auf ihn auf, wenn Ruth und ich manchmal abends ausgingen. Im zweiten Stock unseres langgestreckten Mietshauses wohnten Otto und Edith Frank, mit ihren Töchtern Margot und Anne. Die Franks stammten aus Frankfurt am Main. Wie so viele andere Flüchtlinge in Amsterdam hatten sie die Zeichen der Zeit in Gestalt antisemitischer Parolen und Gesetze richtig gedeutet. Sie hatten beschlossen, Deutschland zu verlassen, solange es noch ging, und ließen sich kurz nach uns in unserem Viertel nieder. Wie wir glaubten sie, dass Holland vor den Nazis sicher sei. Und wie wir warteten sie darauf, dass sich die Lage schon wieder normalisieren würde. Niemand konnte das tragische Schicksal vorhersehen, das sie ereilen sollte und niemand konnte ahnen, dass Annes Name weltbekannt werden würde. Da wir mit der Familie Frank viel gemeinsam hatten, freundeten wir uns bald an. Wir besuchten uns gegenseitig, plauderten, spielten Bridge und tranken Kaffee miteinander. Otto war ein rühriger Geschäftsmann, der genau wie ich, wieder ganz von vorne anfangen musste. Extrovertiert und energisch, wie er war, stellte er sich unverdrossen jeder Herausforderung. Sollte er jemals verzagt gewesen sein, so ließ er es sich jedenfalls nicht anmerken. Ich kann nicht sagen, dass ich ihn wirklich mochte. Er war mir zu rechthaberisch, aber die Hingabe, mit der er für seine Familie sorgte und sein Optimismus in schwierigen Situationen, nötigte mir Respekt ab. Seine Frau Edith hatte große Probleme, sich mit den neuen Lebensbedingungen zu arrangieren. Das Erlernen der holländischen Sprache fiel ihr schwer und oft sprach sie sehnsüchtig von ihrem früheren Leben in Deutschland. Sie war voller Angst und wirkte unglücklich. Meiner Ansicht nach litt sie unter Depressionen. 
Gut mochte sie jedoch sehr gerne und so wurden die beiden bald gute Freundinnen. Anne war sieben Jahre älter als Peter. Im Gegensatz zu ihrer größeren Schwester Margot, die ruhig und fleißig war, war Anne ein offenes, quicklebendiges Mädchen, das kleine Kinder liebte. Ihr Lachen war ansteckend. Sie war bei allen Leuten sehr beliebt. Unsere Wohnung hatte nach hinten hinaus einen kleinen Garten, wo sie mit Peter spielte, als er noch ein Baby war. Als er älter wurde, kam sie oft zum Babysitten. Während der heißen Sommermonate ließen die beiden mit dem Gartenschlauch Wasser in einen großen Zinkwanne und gingen in den kleinen Garten zum Schwimmen. Anne war sehr kreativ, spielte gerne Brettspiele, las Peter Bücher vor und beantwortete geduldig seine ständigen Fragen. Wurde es ihr doch einmal zu viel, pflegte sie zu sagen, Halt, du fragst mir gleich noch ein Loch ins Bauch. Peter kugelte sich dann stets vor Lachen. Sie war eines jener Mädchen, die sich an der Schwelle zum Teenager stehend in einem Moment ganz erwachsen benehmen können und dann im nächsten Augenblick mit den Kleinkindern von nebenan fangen zu spielen. Ja, vielen Dank, Alexander. Jetzt müssen wir noch schauen, dass Peter wieder zu hören ist. Peter, you have to uh, agree that uh, the mic is going on again. Yes, wonderful. Okay. So we heard a little extract uh, uh, from your father's memoirs from the book you have been publishing. And we heard a little bit more about the nice uh, neighborhood you uh, were living in. And again, we have prepared a, a picture that we would like to share uh, with the uh, audience. And that is this picture. This shows uh, the so-called Wolkenkrabber, the Wolkenkratzer, which from a today's perspective uh, sounds, uh, yeah, looks a little bit uh, funny, but indeed this one was one of the highest, I think for a certain time it was even the highest uh, uh, building in Amsterdam. So it was a very modern uh, uh, part of the city of Amsterdam where you were living. And we can see two red squares on this picture and maybe you can tell us a little bit more about who was living there and yeah a little bit more in general about this neighborhood um well um that tall building was called the skyscraper and as it happened in the uh, when we, one of our visits to Amsterdam, we 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 have a acquaintance uh, who gave us quite a lot of information, who is a Montessori or was a Montessori teacher living there. The the the, the red square on the street level is where we lived, number seventeen, and um, as you can see, the two doors here. I don't know if you can see me doing this on the upstairs. No. <laughs> okay, and that is where the Franks live. Um, um, yes. Anything else? Yeah, you, in the in the book, um, we've just heard that you were neighbors and that Anne sometimes was taking care of you and uh, yeah, was your kind of babysitters. Uh, can you tell us a little bit more about, have you any remember, any memories of uh, other people living on the square? What kind of neighborhood was it? And was it something you have good memories of? Was it a nice, a lovely uh, neighborhood? Well, um, it was we all know that you were very young, but still. <laughs> well, it was a neighborhood, uh, um, it was a lovely neighborhood because as you can see, the two streets of Merveda Plain converged to the, to the skyscraper. On this side, looking at it, was a big avenue. And 
In fact, Dr. Frank had, had, had a store, uh, you cannot see me, um, walking away from, from the park across the, the, um, the avenue. Anne was, yes, my babysitter, as you heard, um, playmate. And she, she was in our apartment at some point, uh, almost, if not daily, every two days. Um, yes, as you heard, she was extremely creative. Um, a little flirty and a little prankish and funny. And uh, her mother, Edith, and Margot were, comp were very different. Margot... I don't remember very much anything about Margot because she was quiet and always, um, I don't know, in a room. I don't know what she was doing. And the mother, you know, the two families came from similar backgrounds in Germany. Uh, Frank from Frankfurt, my parents from Nuremberg, but both middle, middle upper class families um, that had some um, money before uh, fleeing. And so Edith didn't do well adjusting. And Susan, my wife, uh, who uh, was a, a psychiatric mental health social worker for 40 something years. And I heard this from somebody else. She's, Edith was a little bit on the maybe depressed side. I don't want to say that she was depressed, but she was and actually she had her own rules and the, one of the rules was order. So Anne was not order. Anne would leave her papers all over the place. So this was a problem for Edith, um, which prompted, if I may say so, the Entstehung des diary of Anna Frank. How? At some point, Edith told my mother that she was complaining, Anna leaving the papers, this, 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 this. So my mother said, why don't you buy her a diary for her 13th birthday? And so she did. And the rest is history. Yeah. And we have proven that and if it wouldn't have been for my mother's suggestion, there wouldn't have been a diary of Anna Frank. But um, so we played also across the, in the park and she would pick me up and go pick me up from school. Uh, one day she, um, my father being in the toy business until the occupation of the Netherlands. So I, I was a popular kid and had toys. So one day I got this big scooter and I still remember it. Uh, 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 the color was uh, midnight blue and big wheels and etc. So naturally she came and immediately had to experiment, sat me on the front and off we went on the park. The ground was gravel, a bad maneuver, we fell and I ripped up the chin in my face and that started to bleed heavily, but it was not a big problem. The problem was uh, 1938-39, it was already really difficult to get ju uh, doctors and go to a hospital and this, but uh, my grandmother was home as uh, um, um, uh, collected as she always was and no big uh, emotions. Uh, Anna was terribly uh, sad and crying and this and it was my fault and etc etc so eventually I got sewn up by a doctor and to some sometimes I tell people I have a souvenir of Anna that's in the bottom of my chin so <laughs> um, it was a good street the people came from different places in, 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 in Eastern Europe and there were people who were not Jewish. And I would love Susan to, to tell the story because we, two years ago, we found out that in, 
with uh, uh, Anna Frank lived not in the same, um, uh, not in the same apartment, but in there was the consul of Ecuador. And it's a, it's a, you want to tell the story? Yeah, well, well one of them, uh, the father, the brother was an anti-Semite. Now, with a friend of ours who lives in our, what used to be our apartment, who used to work for Anna Frank in Amsterdam, became a historian and lecturer in her own right. And she found out all these things and we were um, more than assuming that my mother must have known this family uh, and that because of this anti-Semitic lineage in his family, we didn't go to Ecuador. Um, so that didn't, didn't happen. Yeah. You're talking about the book of Rian, uh, that's her name. Uh, I just forgot her surname, but uh, she has written a wonderful book about the neighborhood of the Merve de Plain. Correct. Uh, and unfortunately, this book doesn't exist yet in German, but uh, only in Dutch. But maybe at some time there will be a translation. Peter, you already mentioned the op occupation in May 1940. We uh, have two, picture, two more pictures of the uh, Frank family and your family, uh, both taken in 1940. So around the, uh, the time when uh, there was the occupation uh, of the Netherlands. Uh, on the left side, we see uh, one of the few pictures of the whole family. Frank, there are not that many, or, or even th uh, so that Otto took a lot of pictures. And it's interesting because this picture is also taken on the Merve de Plain, as we can see uh, in the background. And on the right-hand side, we see a picture of you as a about four year old boy with your uh, grandmother and your mother Ruth. And we have also taken a picture from your father from uh, that time. 1940, uh, can you tell us um, a little bit more how the situation changed after the occupation of Nazi Germany of the Wehrmacht uh, in the Netherlands for you and your family? Well, as I had indicated uh, uh, a little while ago, um, the situation for the Jewish people in uh, non-Jewish people, but mostly Jewish people at that time, uh, started to, to proceed in nine, as of 1933, 1932 even. And then 33, Hitler becomes chancellor etc. Um, gradually, until the occupation, the situation in Amsterdam started to get um, um, tough. Um, there were different laws that, that started to, 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 to be uh, instituted and that you all heard. So it, it became a problem. And one of the problems was uh, politically the German youth and not German youth. And some people were involved in the uh, Nazi party and something developed, which was uh, something that is not always mentioned very much and that's betrayal, the betrayal of people within families and friends. Now, Amsterdam was particularly, and the Netherlands, I would believe, but Amsterdam, uh, the, the people were very friendly. Gradually, that started to not be anymore. And the trail produced mistrust. And so people became very scared of who was going to betray who, who was who. Um, naturally, there, was, uh, there were patrols, and then uh, the military, the Germans on the streets, and um, 
and then it became very bad um, during the occupation, actually, that then just some things were just cut out completely. And um, 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 instances of, of people being um, clubbed, hit, um, uh, shot, uh, uh, taken by the hair and done things. So uh, then life started to continue in addition to the fact that the Star of David was invented. Well, it wasn't invented, but it, it came to being as orders that we had to use them. And that naturally uh, did uh, prompt even worse the demeaning feelings that we had um, and being careful uh, in that the people wearing the Star of David really became a separation of society in a society that had been free and very friendly. And could your father still do um, his business? And could your mother still work? Or did they have to give up every, on everything? Okay, they, they had to give up. And my father uh, had connections um, and um, uh, started to do um, things in the black market with contacts who were connected with the Nazis or not. So um, in selling uh, clothes and other kind of things uh, for the armies and so on, my mother couldn't be a teacher any longer. So she, um, uh, we had some very good friends. They had some good friends uh, called the Lesky family who helped um, us in our first uh, part of our escape from Amsterdam in 1942, a Christian German family. And they were very, very helpful and friendly. And so my, my mother loved design, uh, cosmetics, in addition of being very gregarious and friendly, 11 languages, et cetera, et cetera. So naturally, that also brought her or brought Anna Frank to my, mo uh, my mother, and they, they both hit it off immediately. But um, so my mother then, for the less case, uh, who had two, two dress stores, one in Amsterdam and one in Maastricht, she was designing, sometimes modeling, earning money under the table. We will come back to Gerda Leske uh, a little bit later because she indeed was a very important uh, person for your uh, escape. Uh, let's jump from the occupation in May 1940 to June 1942 because it was the same as with the family Frank that uh, your father uh, got um, a call for deportation um, and uh, he was supposed to be uh, deported to uh, a labor camp or concentration camp to the east. It was the same date as also Margot Frank got um, her, uh, her call for deportation. The family Frank, as we all know, uh, decided to go into hiding, uh, but you decided to do something else or your family. What was it an option for you uh, and your father and your mother also to go into hiding or was it clear from the beginning that uh, you will try to flee and get out of the Netherlands and finally of Europe? Well, that's a good question and it was not. Um, let me say that in our family, in our case, um, uh, we did not run the plans. The plans were established by what was happening and we had to adjust to the plans. Now, 
it was popular by some people in Germany that if they were Germans, they were not going to be Germans and I'm German and I'm going to stay in Germany. That is what my grandmother's philosophy was because she said, and I will tell the story in a minute uh, how that all happened. So, so let me not jump. Um, yes, my father, uh, we got the orders or the order to be present at the secondary railroad station in Amsterdam. As did, we learned that months later in, in Southern France, 1500 people in the neighborhood. Among them were the Otto Frank family. Um, we also learned that 750 approximately did not go to that railroad station at midnight on that uh, day, June 12th, but 750 did. Now, the trans we were supposed to be taken by, uh, well, the, the list established what we could take in close, and the train was to transport us to Westerbork. Then from Westerbork, people were separated, the families, uh, seniors and children ill. And from there, my father states that we were to be transported to Theresienstadt. During the occupation, my parents carefully, and there were many guards on the streets in Amsterdam then to make, make sure everything was dark and blocked. We were under curfew for two years, played bridge at night. And in one of the occasions, uh, things started to turn more serious or sour. Otto invited my father and the family to join him in the annex. Now that at that time was a big thing because it was not known and was completely a secret um, um, a piece of information. With that and then the instructions and orders to go to the railroad station, my mother immediately had a meeting called uh, with my father, her mother, and one of the doctors in the neighborhood and discussed what we were going to do. And as you can imagine, it was quite a emotional kind of dis discussion uh, in that my father wasn't, didn't want to leave. We didn't know where to leave or how to leave or we couldn't take anything. I mean, <laughs> uh, we couldn't go to the bank. There were no credit cards. There was nothing. So what do you do? and a little kid of six years of age. So my mother decided that that was not a good idea to be in an apartment. Nobody knew how long, because nobody knew uh, how long the war would last or not. And Annie and I were gregarious and talking, so how, how uh, that didn't make, uh, it, it wasn't going to work very well. So at home, back to the me and tears and, 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 and a, a little bit of shouting and etc. My grandmother and the doctor came up with a solution or suggestion rather. If we stayed, it was certain death. But if we left, we had a chance to live. Susan remembered that uh, comment of my grandmother, and that is what became the title of my book. A day or two later, the doctor that was in our apartment committed suicide. He lived in our apartment, threw himself down from the second floor of the apartment. I mean. 
The next thing that happened actually, call Gerda, which he did. Now, I don't know if you want me to tell the story now or wait, but I will just say one thing that maybe uh, can illustrate some things. I had said that I watched and lived through the visual audio of people murdered, killed, kicked, etc. And an acquaintance in the neighborhood who was about uh, uh, Anna's age, maybe a year or two later, older, who was apprehended to betray people <clears throat> to give the names if they had helped hide or others who were Jewish. He took out a orange handkerchief or, 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 sh or shawl and shouted something in the sense of freedom, liberty, and got shot right there. Now, these images naturally, um, uh, you file them. I filed them in my head. And to say the least, uh, the meaning was no longer a word. It was now being completely scared, careful, mistrustful, etc. cetera. Mm. We the have word, to... The word Peter, that, yeah. yeah the, and I'm leading to, to the story of... I don't know if you're going to ask me about the, the paper that my mother put in my hand. Is that part of your question coming up? Uh, you no. mean when you, when, you, when you went out of Amsterdam with the help of Gerda? We were, we were in Amsterdam and there were also razzias now. The invasion of homes were rampant daily, unannounced, um, uh, people would come and other take everything from the apartment or kill the people right in the apartment. And they came to our apartment one day. And I was standing in front of my mother and father next to my grandmother. And I felt uh, my mother put a little paper in my hand. She slid it in. And, you know, we were not trained. This was the first time that I was uh, under such a situation. So nobody knew what I was going to do, how I was going to act. Very carefully, I put that paper in my mouth. Just by my reaction. And without trying to, to, to cause any, uh, the soldiers standing there, uh, uh, kicking, kicking with the butts of the guns and this and that. I put a paper in my mouth and then quietly at some point swallowed it. And eventually the Germans left and did not take everything away with them in the truck that they had parked outside. And the, the, that little letter, a little piece of paper mentioned Gerda and some other people. And it was secret. If anybody would have seen that, it would have killed them and us. And I asked my grandmother, I said, what will happen with the paper? She said, don't worry, it will come out. Eventually, everything comes out. So that was the first incidents that I had in future ones. I know you have some questions coming up of my hiding or escaping or whatever. Yeah. So, I'm afraid, Peter, we, we have to make a big jump uh, because we are so short uh, in time. And of course, now the, yeah, one of, now the, the crucial point uh, starts in 1942 when your parents decided with the help of uh, Gerda to escape from first from the Netherlands. And we have a map now in the PowerPoint we would like to show to the audience, um, which, um, shows us yeah just first we see we yeah on the left hand side we see a picture of Gerda 
uh, in her early years. You already told us a little bit about her, the friendship with your uh, mother and that she uh, was helping you uh, to get out of Amsterdam uh, and the Netherlands. I'm afraid we can't go into all the details of your escape route and your refuge, uh, but uh, as uh, you put it so nicely together in this picture, this is a picture I got from, from uh, Peter, I took from Peter's PowerPoint presentation, and uh, there you can see how from Amsterdam you came to Belgium, from there to France, to Lille, to Paris, to Bois. It looks very easy now on this map, but as we can uh, read in the book, it was, uh, of course, a very dangerous escape and a very dangerous uh, route. And uh, we will now hear a second part uh, from your book uh, where uh, and this was also a very crucial point in your escape route, where you tried to flee from occupied France to Vigy, France, uh, at uh, River Cher. Uh, and uh, together with uh, an elderly couple and a couple from Czechoslovakia, who also tried to uh, escape on the same route to get into Vichy, France. And uh, Alexander will read us uh, this part from the book, uh, and then we continue our talk. <lacht> Im Schutz der hohen Pflanzen robbten wir hintereinander durch das Feld. Das war ziemlich anstrengend und muss vor allem für das ältere Ehepaar sehr hart gewesen sein. Am Rande des Feldes stießen wir auf einen schmalen Weg, der an ein Schilfdickicht grenzte. Um nicht von den scharfen Blättern geschnitten zu werden, bewegten wir uns ganz langsam und vorsichtig durch das Schilf. Das Gelände stieg leicht an, bis wir plötzlich ins Freie gelangten. Wir standen am mondbeschienenen Ufer des Cher und blickten über das Wasser. Nur der Fluss trennte uns noch vom gelobten Land. Alles war still und friedlich. Flussaufwärts angelten zwei Männer, doch Martin flüsterte, keine Sorge, die passen auf und warnen uns, wenn jemand kommen sollte. Er führte uns flussabwärts, bis wir auf drei kleine alte Ruderboote aus Holz stießen. Sie waren unter Büschen verborgen, die über das Wasser hingen und befanden sich in einem sehr schlechten Zustand. Der Anstrich war großflächig abgeblättert, zwei Boote waren schon halb gesunken und standen voller Wasser, das dritte sah jedoch ganz brauchbar aus. Martin flüsterte, was auch immer geschieht, ihr müsst absolut ruhig sein, sonst werden die Nazis auf uns aufmerksam. Wir hatten beschlossen, dass das ältere Paar zuerst den Fluss überqueren sollte. Martin führte die beiden zu den Booten hinunter. Die Frau stolperte und wäre wohl ins Wasser gefallen, wenn er sie nicht rechtzeitig aufgefangen hätte. Wir verbargen uns im Schilf und warteten, bis wir an der Reihe waren. Peter zupfte mich am Mantel, er musste dringend pinkeln. Obwohl er erst sechs Jahre alt war, wollte er dabei noch nicht von Freunden, von Fremden beobachtet werden. Ich empfahl ihm, sich umzudrehen und sein Geschäft mit dem Rücken zum Fluss zu verrichten. Ich kauerte mich hinter ihn und schirmte ihn so von unerwünschten Blicken ab. Als ich mich wieder umdrehte, war das ältere Ehepaar bereits ins Boot geklettert und hatte sich hingesetzt. Martin stieß sich ab und ruderte langsam in den Fluss hinaus. Als er sich der Mitte näherte, musste er sich mächtig in die Riemen legen, denn die Strömung war dort erheblich stärker. Deutlich konnten wir erkennen, wie das Boot voll Wasser lief und zu sinken begann. Zur Hilflosigkeit verdammt, mussten wir voller Entsetzen mit ansehen, wie das Boot unterging und den alten Mann und seine Frau mit sich riss. Ohne einen Laut von sich zu geben, verschwanden sie in den Wellen und tauchten nicht mehr auf. Fast einer, fest aneinander geklemmert, glitten sie in die Tiefe und ertranken. Es zerriss und schier das Herz. Ich hielt Ruth und Peter fest im Arm, während wir hilflos und entgeistert auf den Fluss hinausstarrten. Dann hörten wir in der Ferne knackende Schritte im Schilf und Hundegebell. Das konnten nur die Grenzsoldaten sein. Sie näherten sich rasch. Wir warfen uns auf den feuchten Boden. Ruth legte sich schützend über Peter. 
Später sagte sie mir, sie habe gebetet, er möge bitte nicht weinen. Und Peter weinte tatsächlich nicht. Ich glaube aber, dass wir alle in diesem Moment weinten, lautlos, in aller Stille. Mir ging es jedenfalls so, als ich innerlich das Totengebet für die beiden Menschen sprach, die vor unseren Augen ertrunken waren, ohne auch nur einen Laut von sich zu geben. Wir hielten den Atem an, als die Nazis in einiger Entfernung an uns vorbei vorübergingen. Als ich das Knirschen ihrer Stiefel entfernt hatte, kroch Martin unter den Büschen hervor. Er hatte sich hier versteckt, nachdem er ans Ufer zurückgeschwommen war. Ich hole ein neues Boot, sagte er nur und verschwand. Niemand hielt ihn auf oder fragte nach. Wir standen alle noch zu sehr unter dem Eindruck dessen, was wir gerade hatten erleben müssen. Schweigend und wie er starrt, warteten wir weiter im Schilf. Niemand wusste, ob Martin Wort halten würde. Wahrscheinlicher war, dass er uns im Stich lassen würde. Es dauerte jedoch nicht lange, bis er in einem anderen Ruderboot den Fluss herabkam. Er musste irgendwo in der Nähe noch ein weiteres Versteck haben, denn er hatte auch seine nassen Kleider gewechselt. Das junge tschechische Paar trat aus dem Schiff heraus und ging rasch den kleinen Hang zum Boot hinab. Lautlos ruderte Martin los, ohne Zwischenfall brachte er sie sicher auf die andere Seite des Flusses. Da die Böschung steiler als an unserem Ufer war, mussten sie auf allen Vieren den Hang hochkriechen, bevor sie im Schutz der Büsche verschwanden. Während Martin langsam zurückruderte, lauschten wir anstrengend auf irgendwelche verdächtigen Geräusche, aber wir hörten nur das gleichmäßige Rauschen des Flusses. Jetzt waren wir an der Reihe. Peter hatte furchtbare Angst. Der Anblick des sinkenden Bootes und des ertrinkenden Paares hatte ihn in eine Schockstarre versetzt. Er wimmerte leise, als ich ihn zum Wasser hinuntertrug. Martin nahm ihn mir ab und setzte ihn an den Bug. Dann stabilisierte er das schwankende Boot und bedeutete uns, an Bord zu klettern. Nach einigen Schwierigkeiten gelang uns die schließlich und wir setzten uns auf die hölzerne Bank am Heck. Aus der Nähe betrachtet sah das Ruderboot ziemlich zerbrechlich aus, fast wie ein blankes Holzgerippe. Mit Schrecken bemerkte ich, dass der Boden bereits unter Wasser stand. Während uns Martin über den Fluss ruderte, stieg das Wasser weiter an. In Ufernähe reichte es Peter bereits bis zu den Knien. Mit angstvoll geweiteten Augen drehte er sich hilfesuchend zu uns um. Verzweiflung stand in seinem Gesicht, da lief das Boot auf Grund. Der Allmächtige hatte seine Hand über uns gehalten. Peter sprang vom Bug ins Wasser. Er wollte, ich wollte sofort hinterher, fiel dabei aber fast kopfüber in den Fluss. Martin fing mich auf und kümmerte sich dann um Ruth. So schnell wir konnten, warteten wir, äh, warteten wir ans Ufer und krochen die Böschung hinauf. Plötzlich tauchten auf der gegenüberliegenden Seite des Flusses Grenzsoldaten auf. Sofort eröffneten sie das Feuer, Kugeln pfiffen um unsere Köpfe. Als wir oben am Hang das rettende Gebüsch erreichten, sanken wir keuchen und völlig durch Nest zu Boden. Ruth drückte den weinenden Peter fest an sich. Ich sah nach, ob er vielleicht von einer Kugel getroffen worden war, doch zum Glück war das nicht der Fall. Weitere Mitglieder der Resistenz tauchten auf und gesellten sich zu uns. Einer kramte eine Tafel Schokolade aus der Tasche, brach ein paar Rippen ab und gab sie Peter als Belohnung für seine Tapferkeit. Wir teilten sie unter uns auf und genossen den göttlichen Geschmack. So etwas Gutes hatten wir seit Amsterdam nicht mehr genießen dürfen. Ja, vielen Dank, Alexander. Peter, jetzt müsstest du dich wieder uh, akzeptieren. You should now uh, unmute. You should get a... Yes, now we can hear you again. Ja, yeah, as we just heard from your father's uh, memoirs, uh, it is a very uh, lively way how he describes uh, the escape, the refuge uh, through France. It is a story that uh, tonight we can't get into in all the details. Uh, it is uh, spectacular and really amazing how your parents again and again managed uh, to find new solutions to carry on, to carry on. And um, when you read uh, the book and uh, you hear your father, then you can, yeah, you can feel how proud he was of you 
as a young boy of uh, only six years, uh, how, yeah, how well behaved you were and how you somehow managed to deal with all these difficult situations. I ask myself sometimes, how often uh, do you dream of these situations and how would you say today, how was it possible that you were such a young boy? Uh, how, how did you deal with all these uh, experiences and all these things you had to go through during this one year uh, uh, escape route from Amsterdam to finally Argentina? Oh, is, that was your question. The question was what, yeah, how, how did you deal how, with- How did I cope with it? Okay. Yes. Um, how much did you understand at that time of what was going on? Maybe that's the, how I should put the question. Well, it's, it's, it's a very good question. It's a very serious question. I don't recall thinking or analyzing or um, considering what I was going to do under these different conditions. I have a theory. Okay, Susan wants to, <laughs> she has a theory. <laughs> I, I have a theory about your question. Uh, I believe that it was not as traumatic as it might have been because he was always with a parent who was taking care of him. Mm. I think that was very, very helpful uh, that his, there was always a parent with him. He would, and his mother, I asked his mother, because he's talkative, and I asked his mother, how did you deal with him in all his talking? And she said he would keep quiet when they told him to keep quiet. Mm -hmm. So I think that's how, but he was always with them. So it was not as traumatic as it might have been had he been abandoned. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. But, Thank you. Thank you, Susan. But, but the rationalization, uh, like... Uh, the example of the paper that I swallowed, that was the first incident. And then other things that I think you're going to ask me crossing the share or after, after the share, uh, the outhouse and this and that. These were things in the moment. Mm. So it, uh, think at night, what had happened or not. Yes, I was, uh, as you heard, uh, uh, Alex wonderfully reading uh, just a minute ago, the experience of crossing the Cher River. Now, I'm not going to go into this because you're going to stop me, but the entire process to get there and how we got there and then how we crossed it, which you heard. But all of this put together, um, um, uh, it, it, it caused its, its uh, way of, I guess, uh, you know, we, we were scared to death and then naturally completely saddened. Uh, I mean, death and murder and killings and then this poor couple um, uh, a drowning and we were supposed to be very very quiet not say anything not do anything and they drowned and didn't say anything because they knew the Germans were on the other side of the shore waiting so all of this got into uh, my head and body so mm -hmm. how do I cope with it uh, well, I cope the way that we say in the book, but how we got into the process of doing so, that was, uh, I don't know, the best answer I have is osmosis. Mm. Peter, I'm, a, I'm afraid we have to do another big step in time uh, okay. and come to the last part of your uh, escape route and uh, the most difficult one, I would say, and that was uh, crossing the Pyrenees from France to Spain. And uh, yeah, we have another map showing South France. Um, 
just in exactly. And uh, Susan just said, uh, you were never alone. Uh, you always had one parent, but in the last part of your journey, you just had your father because you decided to separate and not go together from France to Spain. Why did your parents decide uh, to do the last part of the journey in separated ways? Because it allowed, if, if we were apprehended crossing the borders, that one might have the chance of getting through alive. Now, my father, um, I don't know how far you're going to ask me with a train jump and all of that in a few minutes. Yeah, tell us a little bit uh, about how you and your father uh, escaped. How did you make it from France to Spain? That would be interesting to hear the story. You mean crossing the border? Yes. Okay. Um, we are now in Perpignan. So I'm not going to say how we got there. By the way, my mother, uh, just for the audience, was part of the resistance, the, 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 the French resistance, France Libre, after crossing the Cher for a few months or weeks or months. Yeah. And we didn't know that. And my father really learned by chance and there was nothing he could do because me, my mother had just done it. And she was not crossing people off the river. She was helping those who had crossed. Well, now after the, the, the map, so I'm not going to go into that because I know there's no time. But that's, it's full of stories and, 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 and adventure. We are in Perpignan. Now, my father was a chubby, short fellow. Um, I don't want to say he was fat, but, and he was not very sporty. And he only knew English but everything else was with a heavy German accent. So during this entire flight, he was not allowed to talk when apprehended. My mother was the one that spoke because she was fluent, as I said, in 11 languages. She knew French perfectly well in all the dialects, etc., etc., etc. So we spent, oh, I would say, two to three weeks in Perpignan and then Again, the decision was, what do we do next? Now, um, we knew we couldn't go to America, but I, I wasn't aware of that. Um, if I may digress for a minute, uh, two years ago, we learned why we uh, couldn't go to America. And that is basically to make, to make a long story short, my cliff lip. The American authorities did not allow that. In spite that my mother had a brother who was ready to give us the affidavits, etc., etc., etc. And so that was the story. So now what do we do in Perpignan? Now, as I had indicated before, my father was not one to leave Germany. We are now all the way south France. Well, he wasn't ready to, to, to leave Germany, much less Europe. But to go to Argentina, when that came to be, was just a big rätsel, as we say in German. Anyway, uh, my mother somehow, with difficulty, made contacts with a lawyer in Perpignan, and it was planned to have something very, very dangerous and very courageous. And that was, well, the options were to walk across the Pyrenees and go through, um, um, what's the name of the town? I forgot. Uh, in the Pyrenees, the, 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 the country. And, um, and that was decided not to do because well, a lot of walk, snowy mountains, 
then there were uh, partisans and other people contrabanding and, and taking whatever little you had, if you had anything, and killing you, throwing you down the gorges. So uh, this was out. They could take a ship out of Perpignan uh, or, uh, and go back to Marseille and maybe go to North Africa or something like that. And for some reasons that didn't work either. So this lawyer made contact with the Spanish partisans underground and French resistance. And it was planned that we were going to all three of us disguise us railroad workers and cross the Pyrenees. My mother was supposed to be the sto a stoker helper in, the, in a locomotive, dressed as a young boy with lederhosen, taped her breasts, cut her hair, which was terrible because she was a fashion lady, and and smudge our heads and bodies with dark shoe polish. She was to be alone with in the locomotive and my father and I were supposed to be going together. And this was a combination of the Turkish French railroad union and the underground that planned the two trains would run parallelly at the same space, at the same uh, speed, through a one mile, one and a half mile tunnel between crossing the Pyrenees into Port Bo uh, on the other side in Spain. And we were going to do this uh, two days apart. So we did our part. I don't know if you want me to tell the entire story, do you? Maybe you can make it brief, at least the way how you, I mean, it's interesting uh, how you try to, to get from one train to the other. This is, I think, jumping. the question to it people. Was it was jumping. Mm. And one train was a regular scheduled train bringing workers from the, uh, France into Spain. And the other train was a, a, a make, well, it wasn't a planned train. Mm -hmm. And we were supposed to jump from one train to another at a specific point through the tunnel. Mm -hmm. So my father almost fell in between the two trains and I was thrown like a potato bag. And they caught me on, on the other train and etc. So yeah. that is how uh, we did that. But, but yeah. the, the other story that you haven't asked me is no time, is how we got to this having spent a night almost in the, in the railroad station. Mm. You know, what happened there? So it's, it's, everything had a, had a raison d'etre. Everything occurred in a certain way and we were in the hands of underground. Yeah. But you, you never knew if you could trust the underground, if they would come or they would betray you, it was cash in advance, which we didn't have, or we had very little, and voila, and that, that is how it, uh, how it worked. Yeah, so I recommend again the book for all those who want to get to know all the details, because we will now come to the last part of our lecture with Alexander. And uh, finally, you and your father, uh, you uh, escaped and you came to uh, Barcelona. Uh, and in the part we will hear from the book now, we will at the beginning hear a name and this is uh, Senor Klein. He was from the Joint Distribution Committee of the Jewish Community uh, Barcelona. So he was a guy who was very helpful to you. Maybe we have a little bit time to talk about him, but uh, we get directly into the situation where you spent uh, some time in his office and then you get a call. And Alexander will now 
read from this part of your story. Senior Klein ließ es sich nicht nehmen, persönlich den Polizeipräfekten anzurufen. Ich verstand kein Wort, denn das Gespräch wurde auf Spanisch geführt. Das Ergebnis entsprach allerdings voll und ganz meinen Wünschen. Der, Perf der Präfekt wollte Peter und mich noch im Verlauf des Nachmittags empfangen. Da Signor Klein bemerkt hatte, dass ich kein Spanisch sprach, bot er sich an, uns im Polizeipräsidium zu begleiten und dort zu übersetzen. Dies zeigte einmal mehr, dass er wirklich nur unser Bestes wollte. Langsam begann ich, ihm zu vertrauen, obwohl ich seinen Namen, seinen wahren Namen, auch später nie erfuhr. Wir verabredeten uns, eine halbe Stunde vor dem Termin in der Hotelhalle zu treffen. Es war geplant gewesen, dass Ruth im Lauf des Nachmittags die Grenze passieren und nach Barcelona weiterfahren sollte. Anders als wir musste sie die südliche Route entlang der Mittelmeerküste nach Sorbert an der französischen Grenze und von dort nach Porbo nehmen. Ihr Grenzübertritt war genauso gewagt und gefährlich wie unserer. Vor unserem Abschied in Perpignan hatten wir ausgemacht, dass sie im Hotel anrufen sollte, sobald sie auf spanischem Boden und in Sicherheit wäre. Um 4 Uhr nachmittags warteten Peter und ich in der Eingangshalle des Hotels auf Ruths Anruf. Wir spielten Domino, um uns die Zeit zu vertreiben und die Aufregung im Zaum zu halten. Als dann endlich ein Page kam und mir sagte, dass ich am Telefon verlangt würde, stürzte ich in die Sprechzelle. Schon als ich den Hörer abnahm, spürte ich, dass etwas schiefgegangen war. Ruth hatte normalerweise eine kräftige, melodiöse Stimme, doch jetzt zitterte sie vor Angst. Sie rief, Hans, Hans, bist du dran? Ich fragte zurück, bist du in Spanien oder Frankreich? Schluchzend erzählte sie, sie sei zwar in Spanien, doch die spanische Polizei habe sie an der Grenze verhaftet und in das Frauengefängnis in Figares gebracht. Meine Knie wurden weich, ich musste mich an der Ablage in der Telefonzelle festhalten. Peter stand neben mir und wollte wissen, wo ist Mami? Um seiner und Jutes Willen mobilisierte ich alle meine Kräfte und riss mich zusammen. Ich musste unbedingt die Ruhe bewahren. Ruth beruhigte sich etwas und berichtete hastig, dass die Polizei auf sie aufmerksam geworden sei, als sie an der spanischen Grenze in einen anderen Zug umgestiegen sei. Ihr Gang und ihre Haltung hätten sie wohl verraten, obwohl sie ihre Brüste flach bandagiert und ihre Haare ge kurz geschnitten habe. Kurz nach der Abfahrt aus Porbo sei sie festgenommen worden. Ein deutscher Gestapo-Kommandeur saß im selben Zug nach Figueres, weil er dort Orangen einkaufen wollte. Zu seinem Schutz waren die Polizeikräfte an Bord verstärkt worden. Sie kontrollierten jeden Fahrgast und so hatte man sie entdeckt. Reisen ohne Dokumente bedeutete für die Polizei, Jude zu sein. Und weil Ruth keine Papiere hatte, wurde sie als jüdischer Flüchtling eingesperrt. Ruth fragte, wie geht es Peter? Ich sagte, es geht ihm gut, er ist hier bei mir. Als ich ihn zum Telefon hochhob, damit er ein paar Worte mit ihr wechseln konnte, brach sie wieder in Tränen aus. Ich konnte am anderen Ende der Leitung laute Rufe im Hintergrund hören. Ihre Stimme brach, hysterisch weint, jammerte sie immer wieder flehentlich. Hans, was machen wir? Was kann ich tun? Bitte hol mich hier raus. Plötzlich klickte es und die Leitung war tot. Ich stand reglos da mit dem Hörer in der Hand. Mit leiser Stimme fragte Peter, geht's Mami bald wieder gut? Ich schloss kurz die Augen und dachte fieberhaft nach. Die Nachrichten waren zwar niederschmetternd, doch immerhin war Ruth am Leben und befand sich in Spanien. Zwei Dinge waren klar. Ich musste mich um Peter kümmern und meine ganze Kraft aufbieten, Ruth in Sicherheit zu bringen. Ich versuchte Peter möglichst unbefangen anzulächeln und sagte, ja, es wird schon wieder mit Mami. Ich erklärte ihm, sie sei in Schwierigkeiten geraten. Es könne noch eine Weile dauern, bis sie wieder bei uns sein würde, aber er brauche sich keine Sorgen zu machen. Ich drückte ihn ganz fest an mich und murmelte nur immer wieder, alles wird gut. Ich wollte mir damit selbst Mut machen und wünschte so zugleich, 
dass er ganz fest daran glauben möge. So, now we get you unmuted again, Peter. Yes. So, you and your father succeeded, but your mother did not. I mean, she came to Spain, as we've just heard now, but she ended up in a women's uh, camp for Jewish refugees. We know from this, the story that in the end, uh, she managed um, to get out and finally you were together. Uh, how, how did she uh, manage to finally escape or to get out of the camp, if you could tell us this? She was in a cell with a, another prisoner, a woman, who was a spy working for allies, for the British allies. And I think uh, I remember that she came from Eastern Europe. I was never, she had a message for the allies which was an indelible ink on a piece of paper, which she hid in her private parts. And then eventually when she died, she gave it to my mother who also hid it in her private parts. But my mother knew languages and one of them was English. Well, and there were offices from uh, two embassies or consulates, one the British and one, I think the Netherlands, on human uh, conditions of prisoners, etc. And she heard that and through the opening uh, there was a little opening in the prison uh, door, being on the, on the floor. She passed that message under it with a note in English. Now, how she wrote that with what, we have no clue, because this women's camp was depraved, run by depraved women guards. But she did. And that eventually, uh, when the consul or consul employee read that, how she got saved. Um, naturally, the first thing this gentleman did is um, he bought her some clothes because she was practically naked and, and took her to his house where she had the first bath in months, which she hadn't had, and um, brought a little bit back to civilization after which then she called us. And I remember being there for the call naturally. Um, in short, that is how she got out. So finally you were together again and now we could tell a long story uh, how then uh, your parents with the help of different people in Barcelona uh, finally made it to Argentina. Now this sounds again much uh, easier than in, in the end it was. It, you did not go directly to Argentina by ship but via the Caribbean. But Finally, in July 1943, you succeeded and you uh, went on the ship uh, to Argentina. So that was at the age of seven. You were seven by then. We have one last picture of your parents uh, uh, in their older days that is shown here. Uh, I know you would like to tell also the story from your last escape, but we have some questions also from the audience. So maybe you just tell us a little bit uh, what happened then in Argentina. Uh, what uh, did your parents do and uh, 
what are your memories of the time in Argentina? Well, um, you don't want me to tell you how we got on the ship, do you? No. And all of that, okay. Maybe we have time in the discussion later. Uh, okay. let's, let's go directly to Argentina. Okay. Um, just so that the audience knows, um, uh, this ship took two months to sail from Barcelona to Buenos Aires instead of about 24 or 25 days. And there were many reasons for that. So now we are in Argentina and my mother had an uncle who uh, she hadn't seen for years who came from Hof and um, had done very well in Argentina and helped uh, with some money also to, to get us on board of the ship in steerage, um, third or fourth class, by the way. And my mother had another friend who she had known in, in Germany and in Holland, especially. And well, he, he, he was also married. She was married. She had, my mother had told my father in, in before the escape that she would, if, if they were going to come out alive of this at some time, she would divorce him. Well, uh, in Argentina at some point she did. And eventually married this other man who I had known in Amsterdam myself. I sort of called him uncle. He was a very wonderful person. And she had to start from scratch. Uh, we, we, we lived in a, in a flea, flea kind of hotel, uh, one bedroom, uh, a bathroom down the hall. And my mother went into what she knew best, which was the signing of, of belts and uh, I think handbags and hats and selling door to door. And she had to learn Spanish to do that. And my father tried to do something with toys in manufacturing and then worked in import export uh, uh, companies. I was sent to a camp in, uh, in a northern province where Dahlia's parents came from, Cordova. But I have not spoken to Dahlia, so I don't know in what city or not. Cordova was an interesting state uh, because it, it, it was um, for people who have asthma, respiratory diseases, and so on. And in the areas where I was fre very frequented by, uh, by German people who had hotels and this and that and here and there. So uh, eventually when my mother did divorce my father and married this other man, um, things started changing. I went then to a American intern school um, that was uh, Protestant and uh, I had gone to Pestalozzi Schule for a while and then I just went into uh, a primary school and uh, uh, an English school uh, and for boys and that is how we uh, this is how we, we, we did it. Now they, 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 I will just for statistic purposes tell you that the, the distance between Barcelona is about a thousand to eleven hundred miles. We walked eleven months, ten and a half months, not on main highways, but on the fields, dressed as farmers until the Cher River and passed with the Dutch wooden shoes. And all of that is a different, another story. So, uh, you know, mm -hmm. I'm not going to go there because I'm going to be here for five months telling you. 
<laughs> but oh, an interesting story you should tell us is that your father finally decided to leave Argentina and go back to Munich. How yeah. and when did that happen? I, um, I wasn't even in Argentina then. Um, uh, I had spent some years in Switzerland in the banking uh, and pharmaceutical field, and then in America. At that time, in the early 60s, at some point, he went to Munich. And he went to Munich, uh, well, he went to Germany, let's put it that way. Um, I guess he went to Munich, which is Bavaria, as you know, <laughs> because he was not too, too much into Northern Germany. Bavaria was a more friendly um, uh, culture. Um, I guess his second wife must have had some relationships there, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And in all the years that he lived in Germany, about uh, twenty something, maybe more, he never went back to Nuremberg and Fürth, not once, and that's only one hundred kilometer ride. So I don't. I think he didn't want to go back to his roots. He painted heavily and drew in a, what had been a barracks of uh, soldiers during the Second World War, which, which were now apartments, attached apartments. Second wife with whom I was very friendly, she was a very nice woman, would say he was secluded in this basement painting, drawing with his Avanti cigar in his mouth, and that's what he did. Mm -hmm. And the artwork was eventually donated by his widow and myself to the Stadtmuseum München in München. And that is where this artwork is um, housed. It's not shown. And maybe before I kick the bucket, and, and Helmut is going to be very helpful, and other people after the pandemic, we may follow a dream to transport some of this artwork to the Jewish Museum in Fürth. Not just because to honor him, but many other Jewish and non Jewish people of Nuremberg and Fürth who deserve to be recognized and remembered for what they did. And there were some soccer players too, by the way. So. Mm -hmm. Um, um, that's that situation. Mm -hmm. That's almost like a final word you've just uh, said now with this positive perspective and this well, future I, I, dreams I, I, you I, have. But yeah. we have, do we have I, one question? Yes, we have one. Uh, Mr. Benedict Pfeiffer, he asks following. How is your perception about the rising anti-Semitism brought through conspiracy theories and political controversies? How it to fight back these protecting Jewish life and how are we able to understand Jewish people's life better? So it's a question not about your life story, but more uh, about how you see uh, the rise in anti-Semitism in the States that's, that's and good. Europe, we're getting a little bit political. <laughs> okay, I, I will answer that one because as you know, I don't answer political questions. Uh, we are both Anna Frank and we don't get into activism or, or politics, but I'll answer this because it, it goes right into what I was going to say ending this wonderful presentation. The first question is, is Mr. Pfeiffer living in Germany? We guess so. Oh, okay. Yes. The question is how do you, uh, how was the, the, the word, how do we contend with anti Semitism? Is that it? Yeah, and how do you, how do you see, how do you see a rise of anti Semitism oh, okay. in, in the States, for example? Well, obviously, there is a rise of uh, groups, uh, both left and right who unfortunately 
have their beliefs in uh, either extreme right or extreme left. The first thing that comes to my mind, how do we handle it, is what we're doing, both of us, which is to combat ignorance with knowledge. And this is what the Anna Frank organizations have always done and will continue to do in the best way that we can. Um, I think that there are good people and bad people or good apples and bad apples in every barrel. And I think that Germany is an excellent example of how on one hand, we have extreme right people. And yet on the other hand, we have ADL and Volkswagen helping ADL and the presentation being sponsored today, even by the Ministry of the Interior of Germany. And that says a lot and there are laws. Now, uh, we don't have crystal balls, so we don't know how this is going to proceed. But I do think that the more we, we, we um, uh, promote freedom of speech and education, but putting limits on those who are trying to damage the principles of democracy and constitutionality of the countries involved. That is how I, 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 this is something that we have to live with. And this is a pity. I think that immigration, which has been, I think a misused word by both Americans and in uh, Europe, has been politicized. And I think that when politics get involved into some of these more noble things that we're trying to do, it's bad news. Mm -hmm. I think that we have our work, we, Anna Frank and other organizations, ADL certainly, um, have, and we shall continue to do it. We, we are very, um, um, uh, substantial in, in, in our work and we will do the best we can to, to educate and promote um, what is right and wrong. Thank you very much, Peter. I think these are now good final words and I don't see uh, any uh, more uh, questions at, uh, at the moment. Oh, oh they've started to, there is one, one last question. Um, it says, um, how is, from Vincent Bruckmann, who asks, how is your relationship to the Netherlands? What emotions do you experience when you come back? You've been visiting Amsterdam a lot, I know, uh, just two years ago, approximately, after your journey through Germany, we also went to the Netherlands. Mm -hmm. So how is it for you to come back to Amsterdam? It's a very good question. Um, I'll start a little backwards because it took me, this is my, I'm a, being a US citizen is my third nationality. And the way I feel about having been a Dutch, uh, I was not even a citizen. We were um, um, transients, if you want to put it that way, because my parents never applied as many others to be Dutch citizens. But I consider myself a citizen and my friends of the house, the Anna Frank and others have said, Peter, we consider you a Dutchman. Then Argentina and now US. So it took me a while, naturally I married a, a second generation uh, U.S. and I worked here, etc. And I used to have my Argentine passport with me when I was traveling and I decided 45, 50 years ago, no more. I'm a U.S. citizen. If I, and when I go to the Netherlands, I have a hard a very uh, fond love for the Netherlands. And 
I still think and believe that in spite of the ups and downs in the last 80, 90 years and today, Dutch people are very, very fine people. They're very friendly people. And so are the Germans. I had to adjust myself to, to uh, Germany. And um, I think it's wonderful uh, that individuals like you and Helmut and quite a few others, uh, the ADL partnering with Volkswagen. Now, now there is an example. You have two extremes in history cooperating. This is interfaith. This is what it's all about. Well, hopefully we can be brothers and sisters of Abraham soon and live together in peace and in freedom with respect and, and, and uh, 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 treating us with, with dignity and respect. Thank you very much, Peter. So now I really think these were the, the final words uh, with this, uh, yeah, also, uh, für uns als Zuseher, um jetzt auf Deutsch zu wechseln, nochmal dieser Appell äh, am Schluss und auch die, der Aufruf, dass wir natürlich alle äh, etwas dafür tun können, äh, die Welt so zu gestalten, wie es Peter jetzt am Schluss äh, eben auch nochmal so schön äh, formuliert hat. Uh, Peter, you have given me the key words uh, about telling us about the work of the Anne Frank Centers. I have one more last slide, if David uh, can show uh, the last page of the uh, presentation, because this is now self-promo, <laughs> if you want to say so. Also für alle, uh, die uh, sich für unsere Arbeit uh, interessieren, Uh, denen empfehle ich, dass sie unseren Newsletter abonnieren. Peter ist ein fleißiger Leser unseres Newsletters und ich kriege jedes Mal direktes Feedback von ihm uh, zu unserem Newsletter. Also da können Sie sich registrieren, dann sind Sie auch zukünftig über Veranstaltungen dieser Art uh, informiert. Und ja, das eine frank zentrum hat auch gerade Schwierigkeiten und Probleme durch die Corona-Pandemie finanzieller Art, unser Museum ist seit Monaten geschlossen. Wir haben keine Einnahmen mehr durch Besucherinnen und Besucher. Wir haben auch keine Einnahmen mehr mit unseren Wanderausstellungen. Und das alles macht es für uns im Moment gerade schwierig. Deswegen freuen wir uns immer und gerade im Moment besonders über Spenden. Also wenn Sie sich heute, wenn es interessant für Sie war, in dieser Veranstaltung dabei zu sein und uns, ja, selbst wenn es nur eine kleine Spende ist, äh, uns unterstützen möchten, dann können Sie das auch über diesen Link tun, den David vielleicht auch nochmal in den Chat hinein äh, kopiert und dann können Sie ihn dort direkt anklicken. Can ich I say a final thank you? Yes, you can. Okay, first of all to you again. You've done fantastic and I don't know how to thank you for what you and your group have done. I want to thank David. I hope David is the great babysitter. Anybody needs a babysitter? David Gillis is a great babysitter. I'm just kidding. But thank you, David. Alex, great reading. Thank you. Touch with me and that we can sort of um, uh, establish a nice relationship in, 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 in the months to come. Aaron knows about this today and your friends in Miami, both Tracy as well as Yael were aware of this also. So keep in touch with me, please. We Patrick, will, Peter. Thank Patrick you. and I will be in touch. We will. Okay. Thank you very much, Peter. And you uh, just said the words I wanted to say. Ich wollte mich nämlich natürlich auch nochmal bei allen bedanken. A very special thank you to you, Peter and Susan, that you joined us tonight. Ein großes Danke an meinen Kollegen David Gillers, an Dina Blauhorn, die im Hintergrund die ganze Öffentlichkeitsarbeit zur Veranstaltung gemacht hat. Nochmal ein Dank von meiner Seite auch an Alex und zwei Personen, die auch nochmal im Hintergrund heute sehr viel unterstützt haben, Johannes und Alex von der Initiative Artikel 1, die uns heute ihre Räume zur Verfügung gestellt haben und ihre äh, tolle Technik. Ich bedanke mich bei Ihnen zu Hause, dass Sie heute für zwei Stunden bei uns waren, dass Sie sich die Zeit genommen haben, 
Peters Geschichte anzuhören und äh, sein Buch zu lauschen. Ich würde mich sehr freuen, wenn wir uns auch in Zukunft entweder hier wieder digital auf Zoom treffen würden oder noch lieber, muss ich sagen, vielleicht auch wieder real und in Farbe, damit dann auch die Möglichkeit besteht, direkt ins Gespräch zu kommen, vielleicht auch noch ein Gläschen Wein äh, zu, gemeinsam zu trinken. Wir freuen uns schon auf die Zeiten, wenn das alles wieder möglich ist. Ich wünsche Ihnen noch einen schönen Abend und bis bald. Dankeschön. Alles Gute.